So then we move on and we had talked of this in the last lecture also. So if you see biomolecules are, are known to self-assemble since a long time. And what we want today in nanotechnology structuring is that we can guide them into take specific structures and functions. So there are two ways of assembling biomolecules or nanostructures. One is the top-down approach where you start from the bulk material, break it down into fragments and further fragments giving it the nanoscale and stopping the reaction where the nanoscale that you want, the size that you want is achieved. And then the other is where you can start with the atomic level, which is the sub nano range, cluster them together into the nano range. And then again, once they are in the nano, stay, in nano scale range, you can stop the aggregation, therefore allowing for a specific nanoparticle of a specific shape and a specific size. Right, so this is your bottom up approach. This is the top down approach. Then, of course, what we normally do when we do a structuring or when you make a nanostructure is we do what is known as a guided assembly, where you want to, you know, curve the natural tendencies of the molecule to, to fold the way it would have normally folded and allow it to fold in a very specific formation that you want to guide, that you wanted to fold it in a particular specific way. So what you do is a guided uh, assembly and not their autonomous or self-assembly is not something that you want, right? What we want now is, can we use biomolecules and Legos to create a desired nano machine? This desired nano machine will have a specific structure and a specific function is what we want. And what do we have as Legos in our hand? We have four nucleotides, which are coming from your DNA. And then we have 20 different amino acids, which come from your proteins. And, and the advantage with using DNA as your uh, starting material is that you know exactly how it is going to fold. You can you have a lot of prediction power because you know it is going to follow your base complementarity rule. So A pairs with T, C pairs with G, and therefore given a primary structure of a DNA, which is the sequence of nucleotides, you can very easily predict what is the secondary structure it is, it is going to form, if it is allowed to self-assemble, or if it is allowed a guided assembly where you obstruct certain regions from folding using what is known as staples, and we'll come to that in a moment. Then, of course, you have 20 amino acids, and then again, you can have a primary structure where you know the sequence of amino acids. Now, to predict how this is going to actually form into a secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure is a lot more difficult because it is not as simple as base complementarity here. There are many things that play a role in protein folding, and therefore, this gets a bit more complicated, and therefore, you lose your power of prediction here. But then, of course, because you can replace 20 amino acids instead of four, for a given length, this can give you a higher functionality. If you make a protein nanostructure, it can have a higher and more diverse functionality as compared to a DNA nanostructure of the same length. So let's say you are making a polymer with 10 units. So for here, you'll have only four nucleotides per position. Here you can have 20 nucleotides per position. So a lot more possible structures can be made here and a lot more primary structures would then give you a lot, of, lot more functionality. But then the important difference here is that you cannot predict how it is going to fold. So you cannot really guide the assembly here. The guided assembly is slightly more of a problem with respect to proteins, but a guided assembly is very easily achievable in case of DNA. So biomolecules that can be used for nano assembly, you can have DNA nano assembly, you can have protein nano assembly, and you can have DNA protein hybrid as nano assembly and applications, of course, will look into this. So here is your molecules as in self assembly of nucleic acid. So most commonly, a transfer RNA, you know, is functional only in its secondary and tertiary structure. The secondary structure basically is a fold up over itself. So this is a single stranded RNA molecule that folds over itself in regions of complementarity, giving you uh, loops and giving you fold stems. So stems are the regions where there is complementarity. Loops are the regions where there is no complementarity, and therefore these remain unpaired. And loops are the regions that actually give you the functionality of the transfer RNA. For example, you have the anticodon loop here, which will match with the codon on the mRNA. If these are complementary, only, this, the, only then the amino acid that it is carrying here at the 3 prime OH will be transferred, right? So this is how the functionality happens in self-assembly in transfer RNAs. In contrast, you have this here. This is a controlled DNA folding assembly. I have a single-stranded DNA, which is long enough. This single-stranded DNA is called the scaffold. Scaffolds are single-stranded, right? Remember that. Scaffolds are single-stranded. And then I'm not allowing it to fold 
the way it would have normally folded because I'm giving it what is known as, again, small single-stranded DNAs, which are staples, which allow it to fold only in a specific predefined manner that I've already predetermined. So this is what is known as guided assembly of DNA. This is self-assembly. where you are not interfering with any of the assembly processes, which is intrinsic to the molecule. This is guided self-assembly because here we are providing extra DNA, which is smaller and complementary to, complementary to the regions of the scaffold, allowing it to fold only in a specific manner that we want and not allowing it to fold in its natural intrinsic manner. So this is what we want in nanostructures that we want to define because we want to make a nanostructure for a specific function and a specific structure so that it is able to move through the blood vessel or let's say it is able to target a specific DNA, a specific cell type. So we want a defined nanostructure and therefore we cannot go with the natural self-assembly process. We have to have a guided self, guided assembly. And that guided assembly is a lot easier in case of DNA by putting in staples here, which are smaller uh, single-stranded DNA, which is complementary in parts to your scaffold. You can allow it to fold in a specific manner. And we'll talk more of this in some time. So direct assemb directed assembly of DNA molecules is possible. One of the major goals of synthetic biology is to use the inherent self-assembly property of biological molecules to create nanostructures of defined shapes and sizes. So while the property of self-assembly is being used, now what you do is a guided assembly. So DNA is particularly attractive material for assembly of biological nanostructures due to the well understood and predictable nature of Watson Crick base pairing. So why DNA is important? Because you can very import, very easily predict what is the structure you're going to get if you have this scaffold and these many staples of different uh, sequences. A DNA origami is the nanoscale folding of DNA to create non-arbitrary, non-arbitrary means non-self-assembled. So you are doing a guided assembly. It is ga getting into a non-arbitrary two and three dimensional shapes is what is known as DNA origami. The specificity of the interaction between complementary base pairs make DNA a useful construction material, though the design through the design of its base sequences. DNA is well understood material that is suitable for creating scaffolds that hold other molecules in place and to create structures on uh, all on its own as well. So you can also design DNA structures that can hold certain proteins. And we have seen that example of this in earlier examples. And I'll show you example today as well for this uh, lecture. So we move on. So this is your DNA origami. DNA origami uh, allows researchers to design arbitrarily shaped complex three-dimensional structures starting from DNA. A DNA origami is a process of molecular self folding. A long single stranded DNA, that is what is your scaffold. Scaffold is not double stranded, scaffold is single stranded. Remember that. Typically, M13 fast genomic DNA, 7000 base pairs, is folded into a prescribed object by hundreds of short synthetic DNA oligonucleotides. These are your staples, right? So these are also single stranded. Short synthetic DNA oligonucleotides, typically 20 to 60 base pair long which are designed to be complementary to different parts of the scaffold DNA. So you are now guiding the DNA to fold in a specific manner using staples, which are also partially complementary to your original long strand DNA, that is your scaffold. Scaffold is single stranded DNA, right? All right, and uh, who discovered DNA origami? DNA origami was discovered by Paul Ruthman in 2006. He made five planar arbitrary shaped two dimensional structures with length scales of around 100 nanometer were constructed. Topologically, these 2D DNA origamis contain DNA double helical helices bundled together with a, within a 2D plane by crossovers where DNA strands cross between neighboring DNA helices. These are some of the structures that you can make from DNA origami. Origami specifically is a term that is used for folding paper into very beautiful shapes, which I show you here in the left hand. And then of course, I'll show you DNA origami. And the structures obtained from DNA origami here in these uh, in these here. So you can see there is a whole lot of structure. You can also have 3D structures. And more importantly, you can also make a case, which is basically a box, which is encoded by DNA sheets. And in this box, you can also put in your protein of interest. So this protein is protected from its action until the box opens. And this is what we'll see in later slides, right? So. Uh, 
uh, there is also another way of making DNA assemblies that is your basically starting from bricks and arranging them together into an order to make a 3D structure or 2D structure. So this is basically your bottom up approach for DNA assemblies. So bottom up approach means you have predefined sized of DNA strands that are called DNA bricks. And then you make a wall using bricks and arrange them in specific order, right? So this is what is your uh, bottom up approach for DNA nano assembly. Uh, the bottom up approach for DNA nano structures pre-designed is small single stranded DNA strands, bricks arranged together in a specific order to make a predetermined shape. Involves the computer related design of arbitrary, arbitrary structures and their assembly using hundreds of DNA single strands that form interconnected staggered duplexes. The building blocks are single strands of DNA containing multiple modular domains, which may be designed, which are designed to form interconnected staggered duplexes with one another resulting in DNA lattices. So this is how you make your, uh, again, the DNA bricks, which are predefined single stranded DNA, just like staples, slightly bigger maybe. And then these can be arranged in a specific order to obtain whatever shape you want. So here I show you atomic force microscope image of single stranded tiles assembled here, right? Then we move on and uh, limitations of DNA nano assembly. I've already told you a major limitation is that, you know, you may not have enough functionality if you start only just with DNA because you have only four of the Legos to start with. So when you have just four Legos, there is only a limited structure that you can make. And then what we're looking for is not just a structure, we're looking for a, a function as well. And therefore, at that point of time, DNA nanostructures alone may not be good enough. So while the selection of only four types of nitrogenous bases permits a precise prediction of intra and intermolecular interactions, it simultaneously limits the chemical potential of the DNA nanostructure. Conversely, the chemical diversity found within standard 20 amino acids comprising proteins has advantage in terms of chemistry, molecular recognition, and architecture. And proteins, you know, by their very nature, they, they are basically, you know, uh, they have functionality and they are the workhorse of the cell. All the functions that you perform mostly are performed by proteins. Of course, you have functions for DNA and RNA, but most of the catalytic function, the structural function, the architectural function, most of it is performed by proteins and therefore now, uh, we also need to include proteins in our nanostructure assembly so as to have a functional and a desired nanostructure. Proteins are capable of catalyzing biochemical reactions in interacting with both organic and inorganic molecules and assembling into multimeric complexes to encapsulate molecules or provide intracellular structural support. So all these functions can be provided by proteins and therefore what we now want to make is a DNA nano, nanoprotein structure. When you combine the two together, you get the best of both the worlds, and that is where you actually get your functional nanostructures. Uh, the demerit also is there with protein. The pros, pros is that you have 20 amino acids, and uh, proteins are known to be functional. So when you make 20 amino acids and you make a certain length of a polymer, it would ideally have some function. The cons or the demerits of the system is that you will not have enough control on the assembly process. So therefore, and you'll also not have enough prediction process, prediction power in terms of how this protein is going to function, right? So therefore, the diverse functional groups among amino acids that vary in electrostatic charge and hydrophobicity complicate the prediction of how the protein folds into a 3D structure. 